Hello, hello, hello. I'm Stephanie. I am a co-host of The Dope, and I am here with my beautiful girlfriend, Abby. Hi. Um, I'm hosting this week. Maui has entrusted me uh, to uh, take care of tonight's episode for a whole hour. <clears throat> so, like anyone would, I'm going to talk about something that he wouldn't let me talk about if he was here, which is Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> me and Abby are massive Taylor Swift fans. You can't see any of our Taylor Swift posters from here. Um, they are there, though. But we promise they exist in this room. And in case you were wondering, I brought all my album covers uh, to show you guys, just to prove uh, <laughs> how big of a fan I am and to really show you that I was a fan since the beginning. Um, Taylor Swift has her MySpace link on the back of her first album here I've got. <laughs> Uh, so that's how we'll start. Um, we're going to talk about Taylor Swift's two new albums she put out last year, which like two, two which we're still not over. And we're also going to talk about her re-recordings she has uh, announced and has coming up, which is also very exciting. Definitely. Um, yeah, so we'll just start chatting about uh, how we got into Taylor Swift, um, how, how, how old we were and how long we've been a fan. Uh, do you want to go first, Abby? Well, I am... From Tennessee, <laughs> um, about about two thousand six ish, they got us new. They they got new buses for the school. Couple, not not many, but um, they had radios, <laughs> and our bus driver was an old farmer, so we had to listen to country music. <laughs> And I, my family couldn't afford like an iPod or something. So like I had to just listen to the country music. I eventually found like a super cheap, like portable CD player. Um, and, you know, use that, but mostly just had to listen to country music. <laughs> and I hated most of it, <laughs> but um, there were, there were a couple things that stood out and, uh, Taylor Swift was one of them. And then I remember very clearly, like when her first album came, like first came out, um, one of my friends at the time that we like, <laughs> that we rode the bus together, um, her, her dad got her the CD. And so like, by that point I had my little portable CD player. And so she would bring her, her Taylor Swift CD and I would have my CD player and we'd listen to it together on the bus <laughs> on the way to school and on the way home. <laughs> And so, like, yeah, I've I've been listening since since Tim McGraw, since Tim McGraw <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> My story happened around the same time, but very different. Well, I guess not that different. I was kind of going through a country phase when I was that age. Not gonna lie, <laughs> um, but that sure was a choice. It it was a choice. <laughs> like you didn't have a choice. I had a choice. <laughs> no, but. Um, I was going to my friend Megan Kate's house and they, you know, we were kids and they were younger than me. I was 12 or 13. And they were like, Stephanie, come see this dance. We made up to this song on the radio. And I'm like, cool. And they showed me their own little cute choreographed dance to picture to burn. And then they also had one to our song. And, um, although I was appalled at the original lyrics in picture to burn, which included lines like, um, Oh, what's the gay line? I can't think uh, of it now. Go and tell your friends that I'm obsessive and crazy. That's fine. I'll tell mine. You're gay. Yeah. And little conservative Stephanie was like, oh. <laughs> but she doesn't sing that line anymore. She doesn't. She She's changed it. She's she's learned. And she changed it very quickly. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, it's not even in my version of the album. Abby has the OG version, but she's cooler and more Southern than me, so... <laughs> Um, and then I, like, I immediately, like, bought this album at probably, like, Walmart. <laughs> and I remember when the next one came out and the next one. And mm -hmm. she had this rhythm going on for a few years where she released an album every two years. So you could, like, count on a Taylor Swift album coming every, in the fall. Every other fall, yeah. Yep. And that was always, like, so exciting. Um And there was something really wonderful. And you probably feel this way, too, since we both got into Taylor during her first album. Something really wonderful about growing up with this music. Yeah. Uh, Taylor is a few years older than us. She's... 31. Yeah, she's... 
How old am I? She's six years older than me, <laughs> five years older than you. Um, which doesn't matter much now, but mattered a lot when we were teenagers. But it felt like she was writing the music for the next chapter of my life. Um, yeah. Yeah. And... I still look back on these songs and they still play in my head and I can close my eyes and remember a very specific moment. I listened to them, a special moment, uh, the first time I listened uh, all the way through college and through December, which was the last time she put out an album. Um, I identify with Taylor Swift's music on such like a, like a primal level. Like I feel like it's a part of me. I often joke that if Taylor Swift ever stops making music, just kill me. Cause I don't know what's going to happen next. If I don't have a Taylor Swift album to narrate my life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and um, then in 2017, we became friends online. We originally bonded over um, the band Bastille. Uh, but <laughs> our bond was just, uh, amplified when we also found out that we share this intense love for Taylor Swift, yeah. which at the time still felt, I don't know. Tell me if you had the same experience listening and loving Taylor Swift growing up, especially during the phase where she was like super scrutinized by the media and hated by every like high schooler, you knew. Yeah. Like it felt, I don't want to say rebellious because it's Taylor Swift, <laughs> but if there was something, there was a special feeling to it. Maybe you can put better yeah. words. Well, to like, that. so I remember when Red came out, um, I had a class in college taught by a professor who hated her. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it was a class that was specifically about like um, media. And so like, we had to talk about like current events. Like we would have to, <laughs> to bring in, like three different current events articles every like week or so. So like we were constantly talking about like whatever was the the thing in the news. And so when We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together came out, she sure had things to say about it. Um, oh, and so like it was one of those things that was kind of, I, I always felt like I had to like defend mm -hmm you know why I like this music um which was I mean you know everyone has different tastes like what you like you know like I shouldn't have to defend what I like to someone else but they people I mean she was a teacher and she was being kind of rude about it like <laughs> it was cool to hate taylor swift especially in like 2010 2012 i'd say all the way up until um we are never ever getting back together especially i'd say up till like shake it off like yeah that was when people were like okay maybe this isn't so bad yeah you know what you're right 1989 was kind of the turning point yeah. For, for like a couple of years mm -hmm. and then everyone turned on her again yeah um, I, yeah you're right um and <laughs> i want to hear you talk about this next thing a little bit uh so i was never in like a swifty fandom community online until like literally like last year um i never cared about who she was dating because that was my defense if people were like oh she dates all these boys and only writes songs about her boyfriends which we know now but um, I would say, well, I don't care about her relationships. I just care about the music. But Abby <laughs> did care about her relationships. And it's so funny now because I'll be like, Abby, who is I knew you were trouble about? And she'll just John be like, Mayer. all right, this guy. <laughs> or Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> and then she has explanations for like well, why mean, people think that. And, and none of it is like that because despite everyone like um throwing a fit about her like using her her exes to make money and and to produce her music she never outright says this is who the song is about like there might be hints and and she writes like specific details because she writes very personal lyrics um but she she has said in multiple interviews like notoriously in like interviews with Ellen where or she would like push her to try to say who she'll say like, you know, that's the one thing that I can keep to myself. And she, she would never outright say 
yes, dear John is about John Mayer. You know, like it's it's not. Yeah. So nothing is like set in stone. I'm absolutely right. Um, but I I was one of those kids. <laughs> Oof. I was heavily invested in like all of the like Disney Channel stars and like Disney adjacent stars like Taylor Swift. Like all of that like drama. <laughs> so cute. I don't know why. And like, you know, of course I would grow up to like enjoy like writing and analyzing stuff about movies and books and music and stuff because I was really into that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and so like yeah, I was like <laughs> I was heavily invested with like all of that. So like anytime something was was discussed about like anyone any her music was about like i was like on top of it (laughs) and i didn't have (laughs) we we didn't have internet (laughs) back home um i lived kind of like (laughs) middle of nowhere um i had a neighbor on one side (laughs) uh so like we didn't have internet it didn't really the only internet that reached where i lived was really expensive so we just we just didn't do it um so the only access I had to that sort of information was like uh, one of my friends had a subscription to Tiger Beat magazine. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> and um, anytime I would get a little bit of money, I would like buy up those like tween magazines <laughs> that weren't really gossipy. It was more like um, it would have like a gossipy headline on the cover, but then it'd be like the story about how like how Miley learned to believe in herself uh, you know, like those sort of things. They were full of posters. I loved the posters. I mm-hmm. had to throw a bunch of them out when I moved. I was very <laughs> sad about it. No, I wasn't <laughs> going to let you hang uh, 2008 Demi Lovato in our bedroom. I wasn't going to hang it up. I just wanted to keep it for, you know, sentimental reasons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Do you have anything else to say kind of about, like, especially about the way the media treated her during those um like her, the first 10 years of her career especially she was so young um yeah. how old was she when taylor swift came out like 16 I yeah think. and immediately she had to deal that is so young to have to deal with yeah. shit from the media like that especially when she is writing the majority of these songs either by herself or with only one or two other songwriters. And they're all very personal to her. Yeah. And, and just that get, sort of thing was heavily debated in the beginning. Yeah. Um, like people didn't believe that yeah. she wrote her own music and, and to get completely shit on by the media at such a young age and for it to be cool to hate Taylor Swift when we were in yeah. high school. Um, but that didn't stop her. And in fact, with reputation, she like was just all like, you know, Fuck you, everyone who's ever done that to me. Uh, and that was almost like a like a baptism in way of like her her being like, yeah, this is how I am and that's okay and I'm going to keep making music and you know what, you can't fucking stop me. And it was really beautiful and really poetic and really yeah. well done. Um, we went to the Reputation studi- Stadium tour together and wow, I don't, I, I could talk about it for hours, but I'll just say watch it on Netflix. You will cry. <laughs> I, non, I've heard about so many like non-Swifties, non-Taylor Swift fans just bawling. <laughs> and honestly, I cry too, but of course I do. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like, I don't know. So she, everyone was pretty hard on her. Um, and at the same time, everyone was holding her up to this, like, really high standard. Um, she did, In the Miss Americana documentary, she talks about how, like, her, like, she just felt like she had to be, like, absolutely perfect. Um, and, also and something it was, like, you should watch on Netflix yeah, definitely. is the Miss Americana um, documentary. Like, I feel like documentaries about celebrities are kind of, like, whatever. Um but Taylor's a really a lot of really important and really insightful things to say, and I'm in love with her. Anyway, go on. <laughs> um, you know, like just a few years before she came on to um, the music scene, the 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 chicks were absolutely crucified by country fans. So like, it was like drilled into her 
don't be like them. Don't just keep politics out of everything. Don't say anything. Um, and so, like, even though there was this, like, facade of Taylor's in control of everything. She writes her music. She plans her tours. She knows she she's planning everything, like, really, like, her her label and the country music industry as a whole was, like, really controlling and drilling into her that you have to act a certain way. And so it put her up on this, like, pedestal in the media and everyone was like well you know she's she's too good she's too nice it's fake um and then so they were like tearing her down while also like still expecting her to be this like perfect person Mm -hmm. and you know and the same time like she wasn't she wasn't disney but she was very like disney adjacent she appeared in the hannah montana movie she was friends with selena gomez like and so like all these people around her and her age group were like getting to have these rebellious phases and she was still like she had to be the good girl she had to be um completely like pg family friendly um can't talk about anything controversial can't um like it it was just a really like excessively (laughs) excessively um strict standard that she was being held to and uh so it seemed like anytime she did anything that seemed even slightly off from that people threw a fit Mm -hmm. especially like coming from the south where like people are super conservative and very into country music like i saw a lot of that sort of stuff like Mm -hmm. she wasn't she wasn't country enough them she wasn't she wasn't good enough to be a country star she shouldn't be winning all these country awards she's not she's not good enough for that um why didn't jason aldean win this award when uh instead of her you know like those sort of things and um really it's just it's it's not it's it's a space that's not super friendly for for women creators and she's she's a very privileged white woman like i can't imagine how difficult that space must be for very privileged white straight woman can't imagine how difficult country music must be for like queer people people of color like Mm -hmm. i i've been very uh not involved with the country music scene for a while so i don't know like how far it's come um but i do know like there's recently been a lot of drama with um with a particular country singer saying racist things so like it clearly hasn't progressed very much yeah um but yeah i just it it was thrown at her from a young age from an industry that she loved so much and then on top of that like everything else around her too like all the like gossip rags and paparazzi were also piling on top of what country music fans and critics were already saying and it was just everyone was piling all this negative stuff on top of her. It was awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she just powered through it. And they kept making music, wrote a whole album by herself just to prove she could. (laughs) And like a 14 track album, wasn't it? It was, was, yeah, it's a long album. It's a long album. And, um, came out on the other end. If, if, if she's even (laughs) come out you know because um she is still still going through it right yeah she's still going through it um oh i have this little wi-fi signal up here my connection is unstable oh no hopefully we're fine um so before we move on to kind of her newer stuff um do you want to speak to maybe like what are the things that she did that even when everyone in high school was like, why do you like Taylor Swift? Why do you listen to her? It's so cool to hate her. You know, she just wants attention. You know, what are the things that were always in your head, like that made you continue to love her when everyone told you not to? I mean, for me, I'm a songwriter myself. I've been writing songs since middle school or since this middle school, Taylor Swift was like a huge 
huge, still is huge uh, inspiration for me in writing my music. Yeah. Especially when Speak Now came out and it was completely written by her. A girl my age-ish um, writing these beautiful, beautiful songs yeah. and poetic lyrics and moving melodies and things that I could directly apply to my life right. as a 16-year-old. Yeah. And things that I could enjoy with my friends and my mom who didn't hate Taylor Swift, who didn't think it was cool to hate Taylor Swift. Um, that and just like her kindness, I kept hearing. I, I didn't pay too much attention to who she was dating, really what she was doing. I didn't go to any of the concerts there. But um, I remember hearing a lot that she was just a nice person. Yeah. Um, when it comes down to it, it's just the connection I felt to her as a songwriter. That's really kept me ho holding on to her through these years. And you don't write music, so I'm interested to hear what your what kept you holding on. Yeah. Well, I mean, her music's always really uh, connected with me, even though, like... <laughs> you know it's just good i couldn't relate to any most of it um <laughs> yeah i i had never experienced heartbreak <laughs> so like you know um all too well wasn't exactly relatable but um, you. <laughs> uh yeah i just i really there was something about her music that really connected to me and then i also always really appreciated how she would always try to uplift other artists instead of trying to bring other people down. Um, like I, so, so one of my like absolute favorites by her is safe and sound from the hunger Games soundtrack Maybe with the civil wars. <laughs> um, Last night, I actually, like, had a moment where I was like, is this my favorite song? <laughs> <laughs> like, this this could be my absolute favorite song of all time. Um, <laughs> I I love the the song. I really, it really introduced me to the Civil Wars, the band that she uh, collaborates with for that song. Um, so, um you know it was it was really interesting to to have that opportunity to be introduced to something new uh she you know when when the the first incident with Kanye West happened she went to an interview and they were like asking her about it and she said that like she's such a big fan she she didn't understand what happened cuz like that was someone she looked up to um oh, here wow. here recently like she's been really doing a lot to promote newer uh artists especially a lot of like queer artists i've really noticed um she uh she brought Haley kyoko out on stage troy savon um her need to was... calm down <laughs> music video in its entirety yeah <laughs> Uh, there was a an interview she did where she was just like rambling about how much she really liked King Princess, which was really cool. Um, yeah, I I just it was nice to see that instead of like this this catty competition that the music industry tries to put women into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like that was like. That was really nice and, and really got my attention and my respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just love you, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To kind of um, end us talking about her past, let's um, – now, me and Abby don't fight a lot, uh, but I will tell you one thing we fight a lot over. Um, and that is our favorite Taylor Swift album and our favorite Taylor Swift songs. Um it's so hard for me to talk about. <laughs> but uh, honestly, we will scream at each other about this. So, Abby, sift through my pile. Show me your first and second favorite album. First and second? Yeah. Oh. I don't think we share the second favorite either. I I don't know about my second favorite, honestly. I just I know can't leave her and talk my about favorite. I was going to do a countdown. Okay, oh, ready? shoot. Sorry. Three, two, one. <laughs> this is my favorite. The one she wrote all by herself. <laughs> um, 
And red is is third for me. Lover is my second. I I think this is probably my. That's what I thought you were gonna favorite. say. Although lover is close. It's so good, and the Swifties hate it, and I hate them for that. I I could talk all day just about how much I love lover. Reputation's way up there for me too. Like I genuinely can't choose honestly between it's hard. these two. I can't like, choose a number three. Like Reputation is probably my second to least favorite album, and it's still so good. <laughs> like I just love her. Um, anyway, uh, th that is definitely some um, arguments we have in our household. Is um, last just the other night we were screaming about. Uh, Dear John, I think, has the best bridge, uh, which is a big thing in Taylor Swift songs, like the bridges. Um, but she had to argue with me about it. But she's wrong. <laughs> it's, she's wrong, so it's fine. Well, I don't know about that. But All right. Anyway, <laughs> next. Let's see if this works. If I say stop camera. Yeah. So next we're going to talk about her two albums that came out in 2020, uh, which would be Folklore, which you can see on the left there, and Evermore, which you can see on the right. Um, I can also just hold on my albums, but I have a special a special edition of folklore, so I don't have the original artwork for that one. We do, it's just on the wall. It's hanging on the wall because Taylor signed it. <laughs> Not that we got to meet her because of COVID, but um she did this really cool thing because she's a nice person where she gave all she gave a bunch of local record stores signed copies of her CDs. The record stores would tweet about it, and you just have to drop whatever you were doing and run to the record store to get a copy. Hope that you got one. Um, I got zero the first time I went, um, but then I managed to get one the second time I went, which... Thank you, God, and thank you, God, Taylor Swift. Um, anyway, let's talk about folk fo folklore. <laughs> let's talk about folklore. Abby, I want you to recount the morning um that we found out this was coming out so what, do you remember what day of the week it was announced hang on. on i'm gonna i think it was a thursday because i was going out of town for the weekend i'm just gonna recount everything real quick lover came out in 2019 we we were mostly on this pattern of getting a taylor swift song every two taylor swift album every two years 1989 came out a little late um as did no, our, no it didn't it came out on time Reputation was the only one that was late. All right, Reputation came out a little late. College years year are late. all a blur <laughs> for me. Um, so we were not expecting a Taylor Swift album in 2020, yeah. especially with COVID and everything going on. Yeah. All right, now go ahead, tell a story. Um, yeah, I you you woke up before me. No. No. I was still sleeping. You Three. woke me up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're okay, thinking of I Evermore. That. Yeah, it was Evermore. <laughs> You're right. And I was up first. Too many, too fast. <laughs> <laughs> it blows together. Um, yeah. So I, I got up to get ready for work. And <laughs> I just happened to like be scrolling through Facebook before I got in the shower, or maybe it was after. Um, and and I just I saw a post about it. And I was just kind of like in shock for a second, and I had to like wake you up and tell you. <laughs> and you were you were half asleep. And you were like, "What?" I did not believe her. Like she said, Taylor Swift just announced her eighth studio album, and I was like, "No." <laughs> I was like, "That doesn't make any sense." Because Seven just came out less than a year ago. Yeah, like ten months before this, and I was like, "This is a prank." And I was like, "No." And then you showed me the post, and it was from the official Taylor Swift yeah. account, and I was like, no, I was just <laughs> in denial, because I have this notion in my brain that it should take longer to make albums, so I was scared. I was like, this isn't going to be as good. It was as good. Yeah, because, like, the, she announced that it was coming out, like, at midnight that night. It was... It was like the Cloverfield Paradox all over again. <laughs> the first trailer dropped during the Super Bowl, and they were like, yeah, the movie's available after the game's over. And that was, it was like that all over again. Yeah, it was wild. <laughs> and I was going out of town for the weekend for my best friend's uh, bachelorette party. Yeah. And we were so bummed because we wouldn't be able to listen to it together. And Lover had come out since we moved in together, which yeah. we got to listen together and was really special for us. So we were so bummed. But... um. I, I, I left that night for Stephanie's. I think I had a full day of work where I had to like sit and 
contemplate and live with this. Mm-hmm. And then I spent the night at Stephanie's that night. And at midnight, we watched the cardigan music video, me and Stephanie. Cause she's also a huge Taylor Swift fan, but she wanted to go to bed. She didn't want to listen to the whole album that night. I stayed up and we texted and as we listened through the album. Yeah. And <gasps> wow. Um, my first impression was like, wow this is so different lover is a very like pop trendy um top 100 album yeah and folklore of course is more folky yeah she she worked with aaron dustner from the national which is like an indie alternative type band yeah um, which was so different from most of her other stuff but also like who knew that the national was her favorite band? <laughs> I never would have guessed that. Um, it was exciting though. Fun fact. I got into the national because of the hunger Games soundtrack, which I became really into because of Taylor Swift. Well, circle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember feeling the same way with folklore that I did with reputation because reputation is also very different from her other albums. Yeah. Um, but as always, as you listen to the lyrics and become more connected with the songs, you're like, it doesn't matter what genre this is or what instruments are playing in the background because it's still so fundamentally Taylor Swift. Yeah. The lyrics are there. The heart is there. The, the poetry is there. And it's just so good. <laughs> um, and Folklore came out July 24th. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know about you, Abby, but every single one of these albums bring back memories to me. Yeah. There are are sounds that I hear, songs that I hear that connect me to very specific points in my teenage hood. Yeah. That's something I love about them. And even up to folklore has done that because I still think that weekend in the summer away at Stephanie's bachelorette party, falling asleep to this every night because it was so good. (laughs) Um, that is what I love about Taylor's music. Yeah. It's the way it brings me back to simpler times, to happier times. Um, I very clearly remember listening to it on the bus on the way home from work. <laughs> yeah, it's like... So, yeah. Um, what do you think are your top songs from Folklore now that we've had quite, uh, quite a few months to chew on it? Yeah. Um, Invisible String. Um, also, I really enjoy the uh, mentions of Centennial Park because I, I didn't spend much time in Nashville back home because we lived a couple hours south of Nashville. But I do um, I do remember visiting that park a couple of times while I, I when I would go. Um, I need to listen to this album again. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I've only been listening to ever more lately <laughs> um so yeah invisible string uh my tears ricochet which is ultimately about her fight for her masters for music back mm-hmm. um the more i listen to it the more epiphany grows on me like it's it's a tough listen because it's like it starts out the first verse is about like her her grandpa grandfather's experiences in 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 war and then the second verse is about the pandemic and it's so it's like it's a rough listen but it's such a unique sound Mm -hmm. um that i really appreciate it um i really like when she has like one or two random songs that sounds so different from everything else Mm -hmm. uh i think it's nice to have a friend was one of the most underrated songs on lover um so i really i've really grown to really appreciate that one um and after the the long pond sessions, um, after we watched that on Disney Plus, I really also something you should watch. <laughs> definitely, she she really released a lot of content last year. Um, but yeah, after that, I really had like this a new appreciation for this is me trying. Mm-hmm. That one wasn't one that I paid much attention to before. Um, but my absolute favorite, the <laughs> best on the album, is Exile with Bon Iver. Mm-hmm. That one is a masterpiece. It is beautiful. I mean, oh damn, I haven't listened to this album in so long. I say so long, it's only been out for like six months. <laughs> um, 
Yes, I agree. My I'm like looking back through it now. My Tears Ricochet is one of my favorite. That's one of her track fives, fives for those who don't know. Um, it kind of ha- started as an accident, but every track five on every single one of her albums is a very emotional and usually very personal song to her. Yeah. Um, and this is the track five on Folklore. Um, My Tears Ricochet is about her losing her life's work, which we're going to talk yeah. about more and later. It's It uses the metaphor of like someone like this someone being like killed by someone close to them and then that person is at the funeral and they're like a ghost watching um and like (sighs) wanting to know why this person who destroyed them insists on being at their funeral and and acting all nice Mm -hmm. when they're the reason that they're dead Mm -hmm. um it's a very well done metaphor it's beautiful it's (laughs) <laughs> um i also really like seven seven is a really seven's, good. seven's a really simple song um written about taylor's childhood and um it's just so beautiful it literally inspired me to write an entire book for NaNoWriMo this past year um and it makes me feel like i'm young again yeah like i'm little again like i'm seven again and there's something so beautiful and pure about that feeling in a song that makes you feel that yeah. way. A song is also really like heartbreaking though too, because there are slight hints too, because it's about like childhood with a friend, and like there are hints at like the friend having an abusive home life, mm-hmm. and and her like as a child not understanding what's going on, but wanting to protect her friend. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's. It's a beautiful song, also <laughs> very sad. <laughs> and then, of course, I love Invisible String. It's hard to say which of those three is my favorite, um, but also Invisible String. Uh, we haven't even talked about Joe. Joe is a whole nother subject <laughs> I could talk about all day, because listen here, you know how I'm saying that Taylor <laughs> Swift is like narrating my life as I grow up? Well, she met Joe, her current boyfriend of like four and a half years now, um, right before writing Reputation. Reputation came out a month after me and Abby met. We didn't start dating for another, like... So right after the the tour. (laughs) Seven or eight months. Yeah, for a few months. Um, But there are beautiful, beautiful songs in here about meeting someone that you connect with, someone you're falling in love with, someone that you want, you feel like is the one. And those beautiful songs that... Pretty much every song in this album is about Joe. Um... (laughs) Same with that one. Um, same with this one. Sprinkle into lover, sprinkle into folklore, invisible strings about Joe, and and into evermore. And seeing that their their love story play out at almost almost the same timeline as ours is something so special and so personal yeah. that again I joke that if Joe and Taylor break up, we have to break up. That's just <laughs> what makes sense. Yeah. Otherwise, what am I going to do with all her breakup songs? Fair point. Exactly. So Invisible String is a beautiful little song about fate, about meeting someone um, that you've been tied to for a long time. And she says, isn't it so pretty to think that all along there was an invisible string tying you to me or me to you? Um, and it's just beautiful, beautiful visuals. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I really like love reading the lyrics. Like, <laughs> I mentioned earlier I really love "Safe and Sound" from the Hunger Games soundtrack. That that's honestly probably my like absolute favorite Taylor Swift song. I, I think like it, it might be. I really love the Hunger Games, though. It's my favorite book series. <laughs> um. Uh. So like I I love that it and like. That song made me go out and get the Hunger Games soundtrack, which introduced me to this like whole genre of music that I'd never even like considered giving a chance before. Um, I became a huge fan of the Civil Wars. Uh, the second Catching the Catching Fire soundtrack got me really into Monsters and Men, The National, all that stuff. And so like after that. I really wanted more of that sound from her, but I never thought we'd get it because she had moved on to to doing more pop stuff. And 
I didn't expect this to happen at all. <laughs> we got like a whole album. Yes. Of the, the safe and sound aesthetic. Um, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. And that actually when it was announced, um, I spent the rest of the day until the album was until the album was released listening to the Hunger Games soundtracks <laughs> <laughs> and the Civil Wars. <laughs> and then um and then she released the Long Pond Studios version, which was a whole documentary, um, like a live performance of, of all the songs and like explaining. Yeah, which was crazy. The and then like behind them, yeah. almost immediately after we watched that, um, Evermore was announced, and that came out on December eleventh, twenty twenty. Which that one was also announced in the oh. morning, and they said, "Hey, it's going to be out at midnight." Like, How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So. Um, this one was flipped. I was on the bus in the morning on my way to work and I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw that Taylor, uh, no, I saw Stephanie, my friend Stephanie, share the post. And that Honestly, I think that's how post. folklore happened for me too. I think I saw Stephanie <laughs> shared. <laughs> Shout out to you, Stephanie Coulson. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, and she shared it and I don't, I don't know. If, did I call you? I called you. You called I? me. I, I was woke still asleep. Up, yeah. I was like, <laughs> on, the bu- on the train in the morning. Like, yeah. and then you just have to go to work and go about your normal day. Like nothing's going on. <laughs> but I made the toddler listen to folklore all day. <laughs> um, you, you woke me up and told me and I was like, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> that can't be real. <laughs> but then we got to listen to it together. But only half of it because I had to get up early the next day because you got home late from work and I had to get up early. So we listened to half of it that night and the other half the following night. The fun night. of working retail. Yeah, the fun of working opposite schedules. Um, and this is, uh, they're, they're called sister albums. So they have very similar sounds, um, very much kind of the same era in my brain. And I feel like a lot of people feel that way. Um, but just more beautiful songs folklore had a lot of songs written about characters that taylor swift made up little stories that taylor swift made up beautiful love triangles weird things i don't know about that (laughs) um and evermore is very similar uh really continued that um that path of of writing about other people mm -hmm. instead of herself yeah, but I just want more songs about Joe, so I have a problem with that. <laughs> um, I'm still chewing on Evermore. It takes me it takes me about a year to fully digest a Taylor Swift album. I'm not even fully digested folklore yet, um, and I'm very very new. Um, but immediate hits when we listen to it together the first time. Champagne problems, fan favorite. Everyone's obsessed with it. Nobody, no crime featuring Heim. Wow. I love country songs where they murder abusive men. <laughs> That's why I love Carrie Underwood so much. <laughs> um, and those are a couple of the big ones for, for the fans. So I uh, I really, really like The National. <laughs> I mentioned that with the Hunger Games soundtrack. Um, so I was super excited. She she collabed with, with um, one of the band members for both albums. Um, he helped write most of the songs and produce them, but on this album, there was a song like with the National, and it's so good. It's my favorite. It's so it's really grown on me. Like at first, I really only listened to like Champagne Problems, um, Nobody, No Crime, but Coney Island is beautiful. I mean, some of the lines in this bitch. Oh my god! Like, um, and she references a bunch of her exes in this song which i would have never known if abby hadn't like told me because i still don't know about her exes in like a, a like nice thoughtful way too it's not like a ha ha you missed out yeah it's it's like a like reflective looking back on where things went wrong and then how things could have been um because we were like the mall before the internet. It was the one place to be. The mischief, the gift-wrapped suburban dreams. Sorry for not winning you an arcade ring over and over. It's just so good. 
I think I think the the line about the arcade ring is one of my absolute favorites. But there's let me see it real quick. There was another one that I'm thinking of, but I can't like. Oh yeah, the uh, will you will you forgive my soul when you're too wise to trust me and too old to care? That those lines. Do you miss the road to coast you into paradise and left you there? Like this, I can, like, and their face voices. Off. I love it so. <laughs> their voices work so well together. Also, the uh, the question pounds my head. What's a lifetime of achievement? If I pushed you to the edge, but you were too polite to leave me. It's just it's something so beautiful. Such a good line about listening to Taylor Swift write about her past relationships while she's so very happy in her current one. Because we all fall into that trap of like. Yeah. I miss my old best friends. I miss my old relationships. Even though what I have now is great, I miss that and I have regrets with that. And people don't want to admit that. Yeah. And, and it's it's these little details like this in Taylor Swift songs that, like, keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Coney Island is so good. And her her voice with, with Matt's voice is so good. He has a very unique voice. This, this album is, like... Like the the people that she collaborates with have very unique voices, and I really appreciate that. There's even a hidden collaboration <laughs> um, in "Cowboy Like Me." If you pay attention, um, which is another one of my favorites because of this detail. If you pay close attention, the background vocals are done by Marcus Mumford from oh, Mumford yeah. and Sons, <laughs> which is another one of my favorites. Also, Joe helped write some of these songs, which <laughs> oh my god, I love because I love them. Don't at me. <laughs> um, Ivy is another really beautiful song. Yeah. I think it's gay. I don't condone. We don't ship Gaylor in this house. Stay away from us, Gaylor fans. It's just it's not fair to speculate about someone's sexuality. Yeah, we won't get into that. It's... Um, but I I think Ivy's written about Emily Dickinson. Is that the right name? Yes. Yes, Emily Dickinson. She was super gay. Yeah. Um, and I've seen some very convincing TikToks on that subject. So, again, don't at me. Um, and then the other one that I wanted to point out lyrics in is Evermore, which I am obsessed with right now because another one about kind of dwelling in the past, regretting things that have happened, not sure where I went wrong, can't, can't fix it. But the last, the last um, verse changes... I had a feeling so peculiar that this pain would be forevermore. And then in the last chorus, it changes into, I had a feeling so peculiar this pain wouldn't be forevermore. And growth. that's growth. <laughs> that is healing. That is my bitch. Um, and something I can take <laughs> and apply to my own life. Taylor is my therapist. I will say real. this is another um, collaboration with Bonnie Bear. Um, I will say I preferred the way their vocals worked in Exile Me too. versus this one. Her her voice with with Justin's voice is magical, but I do think it worked better mm -hmm. um, on Exile. But it wasn't bad here at all. Like it wasn't bad. Not, not, no. not, not saying that there's anything wrong with it. I just preferred the way that they worked there. I think the best collaboration is the one with the national. Stop. <laughs> Joe helped write both of my favorite songs and vocally. champagne problems. Oh, I'm just thinking about Joe. <laughs> Sorry. My, my only complaint with this album, I think, um, besides the fact, the fact that it came out too fast, <laughs> um, didn't give us time with the others, but my, my only complaint, and I did see a TikTok that kind of, we're um, on Taylor Swift out. TikTok. Follow us. <laughs> Follow her. I don't do anything. I just watch other people's content. I um I do do stuff, so you can't. Um, my my only complaint is that there's a collaboration with I'm on here on Nobody No Crime, but they do backing vocals, and that's about it. Yes, I um, saw this TikTok too. Yeah, and then they pointed out how like that's happened in the. the Past, like notably breathe on fearless right i think mm -hmm. it was on fearless um with colby calais and she just does backing vocals or um so you know a bit better with the chicks mm -hmm. they're just in, which that oh one God, i get I why they, they just did, did i get why they were just there on the backing vocals because it was just like a um the song is about 
being scared because my mom's really sick, but this is her favorite band. Mm-hmm. So, uh-huh. um, but it's ultimately about her, her fear. And so like, I understand why they're doing backing vocals and not like featured because it would distract from the real point of the song. Mm-hmm. But I would have liked, I really would have liked to have heard more of the Heim sisters on Nobody. Yeah. No Heim. And it's a complaint that she does that with the women that she collabs with while the men get like full on. Yeah. Versus, and which, I don't know that, it, I mean, I don't know that it's like an intentional sort of thing. Like it just kind of happens, mm-hmm. I think. But um, it's kind of sad. It makes me it, sad. It sucks. It does. And, um, She's not perfect, and this is this is definitely proof of that. Like, yeah. we're, we're definitely not, like, the fans that are, like, she does no wrong. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we, we know to call her out when, when things are off. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's definitely this, one of the things that, that, that I think is off about the album. I think that that, if she had given um, Danielle, or no, Alana, I think, is the one that does the main vocals on most of their music. They switch up. They all sing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, if they had let, or even Esty, since her, her name is in the song, like, let one of them sing a verse or, or like, lead the vocals on the chorus or something, and it would have been so much better. Yeah, I agree. I also think that, um, I don't think Evermore was rushed. It's, it's very fled, full, like, full fleshed out beautiful album and that was part of taylor's intentions is to show that you don't need to think over these things over and over and over and over again in your brain for them to come out good yeah um you don't need to overthink and over edit and overdo these songs for them to turn out good but that being said folklore is better than evermore i feel like it's too early to say that I, I just think there's some songs in Evermore that are lacking, yeah. like, Taylor's lyrical genius. And as a songwriter, I mean, I'm a very amateur songwriter, especially compared to Taylor Swift. But as a songwriter, sometimes I'll write a song. I'm like, this is beautiful. This is done. I'll put it away for six months. And when I pull it out again, I'm like, oh, this sounds better. Ooh, this rhymes better. Ooh, this yeah. completes the visual more. And when you put an album out four months after the last one, you can't do that. Right. That makes sense. That's just my personal, as a songwriter, opinion. Um, I, I think folklore, and this is this is after just having Evermore for a couple months. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think folklore is overall a better, like more cohesive album. Mm-hmm. Evermore has more like standout individual songs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. You know, like Champagne Problems is huge right now with the fandom um coney island is probably my favorite out of like both albums Mm -hmm. i really love that song Um, can't diss on evermore when she likes coney island as much as she does that's that's very true i think yeah i think folklore works better as like one like cohesive piece but evermore has more like songs that stand out as individual tracks. Yeah, evermore isn't bad, y'all. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, we only have um, a few minutes left to talk about the main reason that I wanted to do this video, uh, which was to talk about Taylor Swift's re-recordings. Um, Abby, do you want to s- summarize the uh, the drama that has led to Taylor Swift re-releasing her first six albums? Oof. Can I summarize it in just a couple seconds? Uh, you can take a few minutes. We can <laughs> go a little over. Sorry, Maui. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so she basically started Big Machine Records. Like uh, Scott Borchetta found her and was like, hey, I'm starting this label. Do you want to be my first artist? She was like 15 when she signed the record deal. And of course she does like yeah like she was she was really trying to make make a name for herself in country music so she like jumped at it and fast forward a few years and there's been a lot of drama with um various people who are all managed by scooter braun um he kind of uses his his clients to bully her um and then he buys big machine records uh, from scott borchetta 
And when she signed that that record deal at 15, she signed away the rights to own the songs that she wrote um, without realizing it. And she tried to buy them back. Anyone who wants to try and argue us that, oh, she signed that contract, she should have known, she should have had a lawyer, all that shit. She was 15! Eat me! (laughs) Come on. Um... Also, like, it's not a bad thing that she's fighting for this because it's going to make things better for artists in the future. It's like with the uh, Spotify and Apple Music thing. Mm-hmm. It's, she's she's ultimately paving the way for things to be better for future artists. And every time she does something like this, she gets shit about it. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, explain a bit yeah, more anyway, about her. So she tried to buy her, her stuff back. She was, you know, basically like, name a price, I'll pay whatever. So that I can own she's Taylor my Swift. emotions. <laughs> um, and the only deal they really offered her was uh, you can have an album back for every new album you put out. No, for every three. Was it every three? Oh, no, it was every one. You're right. Yeah, I think because it was we were like just saying you that put with one out, her you three new back. albums, she would have had three albums back. Yes, um, you're right. And she would, wanted to be free from... She didn't want to have to work under a label owned by Scooter Braun. Yeah, she didn't feel like she, she should need to own, like, earn back her own music. Yeah, and then, like, the, I can't imagine the betrayal she must have felt, like... From the people knowing... that she thanked profusely in her first few album, um, like, thank yous. Like, she, she was so happy to work with these people. She was so glad. She was so thankful for what they'd um, for the opportunities they have yeah. provided for her and the betrayal that came out of that is like, just not only did they sell but they sold to a person who like had notoriously bullied her mm-hmm. um so so yeah she she left signed a new deal um as soon as her contract was up she she left and now she's working on getting something else uh or Sorry. Now she's working on like getting her song her stuff re-recorded. She had to wait for a while because like legally she wasn't allowed to record for a while. But if she re-records her music, then she'll own it. Yep. Um, so now she's in the process of re-recording and re-releasing. Um, which another thing that people are um mad at her about now, uh the the Grammy. Uh, people said that if the the re-recordings would be eligible for nomination she has no control over whether or not she's nominated i don't know why people are so mad at her about it i know also (laughs) so she has released a re-recorded song she did so on valentine's day she released her re-recording of love story which is (laughs) first i think before before we get into that though we got to mention there was i think it was match.com like some like dating site. Oh yeah, there was an the ad commercial that Ryan Reynolds did. <laughs> um, she's good friends with Ryan Reynolds, um, and he asked to use the re-recording of Love Story. So the first like snippet we got of, during a- of Taylor's version of Love Story was, was in this app. <laughs> <laughs> weird commercial for this dating app. Um, yep, <laughs> where like the devil was trying to, to find a girlfriend or it something. Was it was so weird. weird. It was very Ryan Reynolds, though. <laughs> um, so when I first heard about all this drama and heard that she was re-recording her albums, I was very, very nervous because, like I said before, I have very strong connections to her music, very strong connections to the specific way that they sound. And inevitably, when you re-record a song, she's older now. She has a more mature voice, a better voice than yeah, she did when she was a teenager. Improved. They're going to sound different. Um, But listening to the re-recording of Love Story gave me a lot of reassurance that they aren't going to sound that different. It's still going to give me all the warm and soft feelings I had as a teenager. Um, And then when she officially released Love Story on Valentine's Day, she announced that she um, is releasing the re-recording of her second studio album, Fearless, on April 9th. I think so. Why don't we know? We should know. Come on. Okay, hang on. I'm trying to show you a picture of this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was April 9th. 
Um, which... There she is. Oh, she's beautiful. That's the um, the new album artwork, which is a play on the old album artwork, which I can show you right here. Oh, no, I can't because I can't share that tab at the same time, which I can show you right. Oh, I'm not even showing it. There we go. <laughs> I can work StreamYard. <laughs> there's there's the beautiful new album. Um, and here's the old one there. You can see the comparison side by side. Crooked. There we go. And this is the Platinum Edition. So that's even fancier. Um, but we are so pumped. She's releasing six new songs with it. Six songs that she wrote during the fearless era that we've never heard before. <laughs> I'm so excited. And I know. I don't think they're. To think what? I don't think they're all going to be songs we've never heard before. No, I am praying. We've never heard studio recordings. Yeah, before. never heard official official um, release. People versions. pretty much already know what songs are going to be released. I'm praying to the Taylor Swift gods that we get to hear "I'd Lie," which was a song I was obsessed with by her. Um, that was supposed to be on Fearless. That got cut. That got never got released. I'm just so excited because it's such a good song and it's so fundamentally like all six are just gonna be different fearless, versions fearless. of forever and always kind of like no the, uh, <laughs> the extra songs on fearless platinum <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's just gonna be six versions of forever and always <laughs> so um maui willing me and uh, abby might do a album react to those new songs be fun maui i know you're watching this because you have to edit it um mm -hmm. He used to tease me about Taylor Swift, but now he's very nice and he encourages me to talk about her um, during the dope streams and everything. And Maui, I just hope that during this episode, you've found a new appreciation for Taylor Swift. Um, Abby, if you had to recommend any Taylor Swift song, like not a single, to someone like Maui who thinks it's cool to hate Taylor Swift or who maybe is having a newfound appreciation of her with folklore... Um, which song from her old albums would you recommend to them? Oh, I know it's a hard one. I I know my answer because my favorite song wasn't a single. I think for like the best example of like the way her her songwriting can really show emotion and express um, like real feelings while still telling like beautifully detailed and clear story would be I, you gotta listen to both i think um not not everyone will recommend both but i say both um all too well and the moment i knew oh those are both red songs both are on red yeah you gotta they i think they should both be listened to together um because i think that they they i mean they're both the same story um just oh my different God, parts they of are. it shut up um, those, those are two of my top songs too. Um, All Too Well is a fan favorite. Like you talk to any Swifty, they're gonna be like blah, 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 about All Too Well. We all love it. <laughs> and I think I also think um, where is it? All Too Well is track five. You've passed it. <laughs> um, I, I think if you're gonna go a little bit more poppy while still like telling a good story and being lyrically brilliant um out of the woods Ooh, that's a good answer out of the woods is so good it's actually my brother does not listen to any taylor swift like quite frankly none um but he loves out of the woods that's an, a 1989 song Oop, that's style oh it's below it eh. <laughs> um and of course we all know my answer just an example of young taylor swift's like um songwriting prowess dear john uh which is just a beautiful song about also oh, track five, isn't it? An older man who was rude. Yeah, because her best songs are track fives. My Tears Ricochet about the drama of having to re-record all her albums and having her life were taken away from her. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> all right, Abby, go ahead. What are you going to say? <laughs> oh, uh, I also recommend Safe and Sound. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We are already past an hour. This, she said, how are we going to talk about Taylor Swift for an hour? I'm like, did you even notice that an hour went by? No. We could talk about Taylor Swift. I was just nervous about talking for an hour in all general. 24 hours of the day. Okay, anyway, closing thoughts. My closing thought is follow me on TikTok for quality. 
Taylor Swift content. I am covering every Taylor Swift bridge ever. I'm singing it. It's my way to get myself to play guitar every single day. My neighbors probably hate me. Um, I am covering every single Taylor Swift bridge and I'm ranking them as I go because bridges are like a big deal in Taylor Swift fandom. I also post a lot of my cat. He's right there. <laughs> um, and your closing thoughts, Abby? Um, give the music a chance. Like, don't don't base your judgment on what has been said in BuzzFeed articles about her. Um, even though now they like to pretend that they like her, they, they have notoriously torn her apart in the past. Um, <laughs> give the music a chance. Uh, obviously, everyone's taste is different. She's not going to be for everyone, but at least give it a chance. The songwriting is amazing. And if you want some quality entertainment, watch people react to her albums on YouTube. <laughs> it's <laughs> so fun. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I'm a little gremlin and these are my treasures. <laughs> <laughs> Even the backs are pretty. Look Just at that 2007 really, makeup right really there. Really emo on the <laughs> fearless one. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening. Taylor Swift or Fallout Boy. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to us gush about Taylor Swift um, for the past hour and five minutes. Be sure to listen to the new albums, anything you want to. We don't care. And look out for... Um, Taylor's Taylor's version of her songs coming out April 9th. We are so excited. And all her her first six albums will all be released in this fashion with hopefully some bonus songs and some bonus verses and 10 minutes of all too well. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for watching the dope this week. And we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.